Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Monday. We are excited to be here with you today. Uh, we are, um, we've are we got a, an awesome crew here today. we got the law office of Christina Lesher and um, present with them. We've got Robert and Christina. And then we have David Tellison. Did I say that right, David? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, you're, you've got one of those names that people butcher all the time. I try hard not to. So um, we've also got David here um, with us today. So we're going to kind of um, talk a little bit more about what, what happens when planning for special needs is not in place or maybe uh, when it's um, the things that are set up or maybe not exactly what you thought were set up. So um, we're excited for each and every one of you to be here with us today. Um, so from a housekeeping perspective, let me just talk about a few things. Um, you are in webinar mode, so your, your cameras and your audio are muted, so we can't see you or hear you. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, and following uh, today's event, you'll get an email with a copy of today's slides, uh, as well as um, the recording and all of the contact information for everyone today. So, um, and, and as always, um, we like to take questions. So if you'll put your questions in the chat box, we're going to be monitoring the chat box and we'll be reading out those questions and we're certainly going to answer uh, just as many uh, questions as we can. So what prompted this webinar? You know, if you guys have attended our webinars in the past, you know that we have a lot of webinars um, surrounding uh, special needs, planning for special needs. We partner with attorneys and uh, other organizations all across the state to kind of talk about topics that are relevant to uh, our families and when it comes to planning. And so uh, David um, came uh, came to us, I, I, gosh, I, I guess it was last fall. I'm, I'm struggling to put dates on. Last May. Okay, yeah. there you have it. And um, and when David came to us, David was kind of really in a crisis mode. And so today we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about David's journey and what the fix was for kind of how, how they got where they were and then what ended up being uh, the fix. And then, Christina, if you want to just talk about the disclaimer, I know from, you know from a legal perspective, you have disclaimers that you have to disclose. Oh, oh, sure. Um, and thank you, Allison. So just because I'm here today doesn't make me your lawyer. Uh, we we require a con a written contract in fee. So thank you, Allison. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Well, David, um, talk to us a little bit about what prompted your your phone call to me, and and talk to us a little bit about your story. Tell us a little bit about you. Okay, so uh, thanks for everyone for joining. Um, as you see on the picture, this is my cousin Mark, and why I'm here is because uh, because of him. Um, so last fall, or sorry, last May, uh, sorry, Allison, you put that in my head. Last May, Mark lost his mother. Um, and my father and I were the ones kind of left to figure out what's going on. Um, Karen, Mark's mom, my dad's sister, uh, she did about everything she could for Mark. And uh, it really showed. But um, one of the things that we didn't really focus on or she didn't really focus on is uh, the transition planning um, spent too much time spoiling them rotten so Mark is a huge Astros fan uh, you can see we just went to over the fourth of July took a trip to visit Mark and we went to the game um, huge Astros fan huge sports fan you can see him there with that smile it's one of the few moments that he's not talking uh, he's quite the talker um, and he's got one hell of a personality. Everyone around around him seems to like him and turned into a little bit of a charmer with the ladies lately. So that's Mark. Um, his best friend was his mom for 41 years. And unfortunately, when she left, um, we had to pick, a, pick it up and figure it out. So Mark's path, um, he had a bumpy ride. Uh, my dad says a couple of times, you know, we all think we have problems, but compared to Mark, we have pretty smooth sailing. Um, about seven months before well, we lost. Can I ask about one of the challenges, David, though? Because I, I think one of the things that was um, important whenever I talked to you for the first time is that, that you were calling from out of state. You're nowhere close to Houston, Texas. Right. You and your father both live out of state. So when Mark's family had passed away, he lost his mother and his father in kind of a short uh, his, his duration. Brother, sorry. 
in time. But, but so one of the biggest challenges is, is that your cousin was here in a great big city right by himself and you guys were out of state. So t- tell us a little bit about that. Cause I, I remember that that really got my attention yeah. when in the, in the first 30 seconds of our phone call. Sure. Thanks for that. Um, so yeah, my father lives in Iowa. Um, he's retired. He's been retired for uh, 10, 15 years, something like that. Um, and I, at the time, was living in the Bay Area in California. Um, so I was actually supposed to go on a vacation. And my dad got a call from the hospital saying my aunt's in the hospital. It uh, wasn't looking good. So rather than go on vacation, I went there. Um, and just to help out, kind of a good thing I did because we didn't really have any idea what was what the situation was. Um, so we both flew to Houston uh, and met up at the airport. My aunt's longtime friend, Meta, was also, was also there to help us. Uh, she was a big help. So we showed up in Houston uh, to meet Mark, um, kind of a little surprised, didn't know what we were getting ourselves into at the time. And ultimately, about a, a week later, she or five, five days later, maybe she ended up passing away. And from that point, it was like, well, we're both away from home. Mark just lost his mom and we don't know where he's going to live. So trying to do all. And, and, and there was a real issue with that because he he has an intellectual disability. He is incapable of living independently at this point, like, you know, completely independently. So that was a big, big issue quickly. Right. Yeah. So Mark, Mark was well taken care of. Um, and in that regard, some things that he could have possibly completed on his own or been taught to do on his own throughout his life were, were not taught to him. Uh, so there were challenges there. Mark wasn't fully, he didn't really understand his full capacity um, because he never really had to do that. So it would be a challenge in and of itself to teach him these things, but for, for both of us being out of state and away from our home base, um, I mean, it was, it was good to hope for Mark's improvement. And I think he is improving in a lot of those areas, but just the, the day-to-day of Mark's life uh, was all handled by his mother. And we didn't have a good breadth or idea of what that, those details entailed. Um, so it was, well, it was and, a lot and to try I to think... learn. One of the concerns, and I think this is how, you know, Christina Lesher's law firm um, got involved is, you know, you know, we really made a referral to them because one of the things, you know, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to special needs planning and we've got, you know, you might have SSI and Medicaid, you might have RSDI and Medicare, you might be eligible for a waiver. And one of the things that was of concern to me was that uh, Mark uh, was actually getting a waiver. And uh, f- for most of us here, we know that the waiting list um, in the state of Texas is quite long. So um, there was a concern uh, about, you know, what the next steps were and if, in fact, it would mess up the waiver that he waited so long uh, to, to, to get. And so I think at that point, that's when... Um, you know, we referred your firm. So, um, Rob, talk to us a little bit about that and kind of, you know, the, the the waiver kind of conversation and some of the considerations that you guys were thinking about when we we're thinking about next steps for Mark. So, when we're when we're looking at um, waivers, we have to look at where the person's living. Um, you know, are they community based? Are they in a facility? Where does the waiver provide the services? And one of the things that we're, we worry about is if they move from one, so say you're at a home base, say you're at home base, so you're community base, you're living at home with like your aunt and, or your mom and your dad. And the next thing you move to, uh, say, an assisted living, uh, you could possibly lose your waiver uh, because they don't provide for, for services for there, for that type of environment. Uh, luckily, right now, um, because of the, uh, is it the CARES Act, am, am I right? So because of the CARES Act, um, that's not the situation because they're the, he's, they're protected right now because of the the CARES Act. Um, so when we're when we're looking at getting waivers and moving from one place to another, we have to be careful about what the environments are and what we can lose when we do that. Uh, so we have to be sure that they either work or look what else is available for, for that person. 
Um, so such in uh, a Mark's case where, you know, what we did is um, there's the star plus waiver program here in Texas, and that's what we used for to put them on the list so that can provide uh, services in the community and assisted living and assisted living facilities. Uh, so that's one of the things that we can we can look at when we're, we're addressing that issue. Yeah, and just to, and, just, just, yeah. just to book in what Rob said, if you have a waiver program, not every facility is going to accept that particular waiver program. So if you go from a home-based waiver program to a private pay facility like we have in this particular case that doesn't accept the type of Medicaid waiver he's on, you have to have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we, we look at things like Star Plus Waiver. Luckily, Star Plus Waiver, it provides a higher level of care, does not have as long as an interest list or waiting period. And then we've also worked with David to, to, let, to, 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 to sort out if there's um, when that CARES Act ends, and we just kind of breezed over that. Basically, it means that if you become disqualified for Medicaid because of financial reasons, meaning you have more than $2,000 in countable assets, you don't lose your Medicaid eligibility. Once that ends, we've got some, we've got a, we've got an evacuation plan so that we can maintain Medicaid coverage, so. I just wanted to mention um, <clears throat> the Star Plus waiver, if it's not something that you've heard of before, it's for 21, age 21 and older. So if you have a loved one that's, um, you know, 21 and older, you might want to um, check into that. Um, further, we do have complete webinars on the Texas waivers that you can check out. So if you're new to this whole waiver conversation or new to Texas and want to find out about what waivers are available and how to get on those lists, um, you guys can check that out on the YouTube channel. And we'll have that at the end of this um, presentation. But one thing that comes to mind, Christina, is that um, a letter of intent, okay, I, I am a fan of a letter of intent, and this is a, an example of a document that would have been very helpful to David and his father, because to David's point on this slide here, um, you know, and we all know as parents navigating all this craziness of so, the Social Security Administration and Medicaid and you know, and waivers, it's all separate phone phone numbers, right? Like it's all separate, you know, intake service units. And sometimes uh, lately since the pandemic, they've all had a lot of turnover of staff. And so sometimes you even call and you get a lot of misinformation. They're, they're improving, but that's been an issue. But a letter of intent, we also have a presentation on that. And we also have a template for that. But that just is everything, eat, sleep, and breathe about your loved one with a disability, that if you are incapacitated or no longer here on this earth, this is a document that David would have picked up, David and his dad would have picked up, and it would have been a lot more clear. There would have been a lot less digging um, for facts and trying to find things. It would, you know, it kind of talks all about the information about the individual with a disability, but all of that other pertinent information like medications, names, address, and phone numbers of doctors, um, so many things, allergies, things that, you know, make your loved one sing and things that make your loved one fall apart. Just the little things that as parents, I, I always say that as parents, we have forgot more than anybody will ever know <laughs> about our kid. And, but, but this letter of intent, it's going to get that information on there. And I think the other important thing is, is that if you've created a letter of intent, it's true that there is a lot of personal, uh, you know, personal information on there. So as a person, you can decide, do I want to share that with somebody right now? Mm -hmm. Or do I want to share with share that with somebody and let them know where it is if something happens to me? Okay, this is where you're going to find that document. I think either either one is is fine. So um, back to you, David, T tell us a little bit more uh, about Mark's path. Sure. Um, so Mark, uh, again, he, he has these system or he has these um, RSDI and a pension from his mother. And that letter of intent that you mentioned, Allison, would have been a big help. Fortunately, we were able to search through a lot of paperwork um, to find a lot of this information. Um, would have made life a little bit easier had we known ahead of time what are, to get ourselves into or what we were getting ourselves into. Um, I would like to say for the group too, all of those waivers and things that were just mentioned, um, I had no idea what those were walking in last May, like absolutely zero clue. Um, I found myself actually reading Social Security Blue Book, just trying to figure out the definition of some of these before I found Allison and the law firm. Because um, I, I mean, we were, we just didn't know what we didn't know. So I was trying to figure things out. Um, so Karin did have, uh, you could tell with 
the way Mark is set up now moving forward, she she would she did look out for him financially. Um, and he is now being taken care of. He's got jokingly a few people on his staff, um, a few helpers that get paid to take him out and about. And uh, he's looking, things are looking up for Mark. Um, it was a long, long path to get here, but all of these bits of information, um, I think it's really important for everyone on the call. Um, I, everyone I've met along this journey has been very strong and capable and helpful. And I imagine a lot of you folks on the call, call have dealt with a lot of issues, but just the basics, um, just acknowledging that there's basics that need to be taken care of, I think is a good thing to point out here. Um, so some of the bad things, um, and the first bullet point here is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, Karin did have my father designated as a pay on death beneficiary for bank accounts. That actually was very helpful. Um, if anyone has a will and everything's set up, if there's money set aside to go directly to someone uh, in the event of your death, um, that'll make transition very a lot easier um, because I had no idea what a representative payee was. It took about eight months to get any money from social security after my aunt passed away. Um, even worse than that with the Texas teacher retirement, um, no idea again what we're doing there with the paperwork. And that took about nine months to get Mark some money. So um, let's talk about the social security and the representative payee because there's two things I want to mention there. Um, when you are a representative payee for your loved one, there is a form that you can get from the Social Security Administration. You can download it and designate a successor representative payee. Um, and that is something that I do recommend to avoid that eight month delay that you were talking about. And, and a lot of people, you know, I always say at the Social Security Administration, they're order takers. They don't necessarily tell you this, th these things. Sometimes you bump along and you find things and or you find things from somebody else's experience. So I, I do recommend that. And then also to your point um, um, with the banks, whether it's called payable on death or transfer on death, um, this is a special form that your bank has. Uh, that you can that you can fill out, and we do recommend that. Whether you have a special needs loved one or not, it makes things a lot easier if you have um, that set up. Christina, do you have any thoughts or any suggestions on the POD or TODs? No, I yeah, I think it's a great idea. And what I tell my clients is, even if you do a trust or a will, you need to give your executor immediate cash. And I like to have three to six months of living expenses. So even if we have everything set up and your beneficiary designation is perfect, you know, any, any type of trust funding takes time. Um, so I would just think if you're thinking about the amount of money you want to leave to a trusted individual who should be most likely your executor, I would say three to six months of overhead for everybody. I love that idea. And, and, and that's an example, like, you know, David, um, you know, for, for, for your, for your cousin, you guys needed immediate housing. You needed a plan. Everybody works, you know, people have things they got to do. You got to get back to the state that you're living in and know that he's safe. Well, it takes money to get people placed somewhere and things like that. So I think that that's a really valid point. Thank you for that, Christina. Yeah. So, um, going back to some of the, it was about $8,000 that Mark owed, We'll put the air quotes there, owed me um, just working through this. I mean, my dad was able to use the money from car and to pay for a lot of things. Um, there's a bullet in here. Mark lived in a hotel for about six weeks with my dad while searching for options to live. Uh, again, this is luckily had access to Karin's money for this instance, because that's not something that normal, normal people plan for is a hotel bill for six weeks. Um, Luckily, this well, hotel... and luckily your father was retired, right? Yeah. And he had the ability to take that time off for six weeks. There's not too many people that can just take a leave for six weeks, you know, um, and not suffer financially or suffer, you know, vocationally. So I, that's important as well. Yeah. Um, it was a little challenging, I think, to get through those six weeks because Houston's a much different climate than Iowa, um, as far as the lifestyle and, and roads and traffic. Um, but 
you know, it, it worked out in the end, uh, but it was not without its challenges. Um, another point that, you know, how I found Allison was going through Karin's emails and I noticed a packet of paperwork that I think she had done a presentation at the rec center, the Vern Cox rec center in Pasadena. And I just ended up emailing them to start off this whole process uh, saying, hey, Karin's not doing well. She's in the hospital. My dad and I are in Houston and we don't know what we're doing. Um, and from there, the rec center folks kind of sprang into action and helped us out a lot. Um, so that, that was a starting point. And luckily, they were around to help and set, that set us down this path. Um, but I, I don't even want to think what we would have done without that starting point and the groups to support here. Um, well, and the rec center was awesome. And the rec center was a service that um, that Mark was having through one of his waivers, like where they have like those different therapies or different things. Like he had some, he had some connection to the rec center yeah. already previously, you know, to this all starting. So thank, thankfully they were very uh, well-versed and, and Mark and, and helpful in this situation. And that's not always the case. So so I, I, I'm glad that they were um, able to, to help in that, in that regard, because, you know, I think we're losing sight of the fact, too, that Mark lost his mom. This is a big right. deal. This is his best friend, you know, and he's leaving his home and it's like all this chaos all at once. So I think anything to kind of level that out a little bit, a lot of our kids with disabilities um, don't... Uh, don't do well with extreme change. You know, a lot of humans in general don't do great with extreme change, but when we have people with learning differences and challenges and other things like that, and you take their best friend out of the picture and parent, it's, it's definitely a big deal. And I'm just, I'm, I'm pretty thankful for Mark that he had you and your dad, that's for yes. sure. So tell us how Mark is right now. Give us the, give us the updates. Okay. So he's in a, facility in Texas City called Independence Village. Um, the rec center folks helped find that one. Uh, it was a little bit of a transition. I think Mark was afraid of living in a home um, just because, you know, he lived 41 years with his mom in the same house. I don't I think there was a little bit of, I don't know, he was a little scared of moving away um, in some regards, but so now current day, uh, thanks to Allison and Christine and Robert's help. There's a trust set up um, with enough money there for to get through the transition. Um, should anything happen to me, uh, I made a folder of all of Mark's accounts, saying what he gets, where it goes, what his expenses are. So if anything were to happen to me, um, I can pick up this folder and people will know what Mark has, what's going on. Um, there are a couple people. So when Mark lost one of his waivers. Um, the, he was getting rec therapy from a gentleman named Bernard. And Bernard said, well, he really cares about Mark moving forward. And he's doing a little moonlighting for Mark to still meet him once a week and make sure he gets his exercise, take him out and about. And there's another lady named Donna that's connected to the rec center that meets with him once a week. And she actually took him to summer camp this past uh, two weeks ago, sorry. Um, he goes to Camp Blessing Summer Camp and mm -hmm. about a month before and a month after, that's all he talks about. So he is able to still do a lot of these things that he did before. Um, obviously, some of it's new. He doesn't like getting up at 5.30 every morning, um, but I, I don't know if he's ever going to get over that. <laughs> uh, but he's making friends. He's living there. He's, he's figuring it out that you know, he, he didn't really, he's never going to have his, have it as good as he did with his mother. Um, but I think he's coming to terms with that slowly, but surely. Um, and moving Great. forward, I think now that the bumps in the road are over, we can focus on getting back and finding more ways to and have things that he enjoys, uh, like those Astros um, trips. I I'd like to address this um, to to both Rob and David um, as it relates, you know, to you know, to our kids that are living home. There's no right or wrong answer as far as how long your loved one lives with you if they live indefinitely or maybe they live till your retirement and then they have some kind of transition. Is I Rob has background as a care navigator and a lot of experience um, in this. Do you have any recommendations for our families or thoughts about like kind of a slower transition or, you know, is there a timeline that would start 
that would be helpful. It's not that you're pushing your, your loved one into a residential facility or anything along those lines, but um, you know, it, kind of any transition programs or any other things that you recommend, Rob and, and, and Dave, if you have any you know thoughts on that as well. Yeah, uh, I would say first, the thing to do would be start expanding the social circle. You know, really, if you start making connections out in the community, start getting them involved in things, you know, now that, you know, that uh, we can actually start going out in the community again, uh, really start expanding that social circle, getting them to know people, uh, getting them used to being away from home, like going to camps, uh, maybe, you know, um, doing some day programs every once in a while or, or some day activities, just so that way that they're used to being out and about without their loved ones. A lot of times we see that, especially with families who um, have become enmeshed that the, they're just relying so much on each other. We really wanna expand that because you know once the, the primary caregiver passes away, you know their main support is gone and then there's no one else to lean on. And really expanding that social circle is one of the best and first things you can do for, for them. And, and even and, if it's and, just a couple of days a week or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and just to let you know, Rob and I are dealing with this on a personal level. I talked to our sister this morning. We have a, a medically fragile nephew, and she just dropped him off at camp yesterday, Allison, at camp camp. And she's so nervous. And I told her, number one, he's at camp with our friend Allison, uh, Julie's son Ben. And and number two, he's got to learn how to do some of these things on his own, navigate social systems, sleep away from mom and dad. So he's 11. You know, you don't have to start at 11. You can wait till later. But, no, but I just want parents to know that it's okay to be nervous. We all feel nervous. I'm nervous today that James is at camp. My sister is nervous that James is at camp. All these feelings that feel kind of like not great because your kiddo's away from you, it's all natural and normal. But you kind of got to test the waters a little bit. Yeah, and um, Dave, you mentioned Camp Blessing, and yes, definitely a fan, and um, and we've done, you know, medically fragile camps before in the past, and you are nervous. I mean, you are nervous. Are they going to do a good job? Are they going to yeah. administer the meds right? If yeah. you got a kid with a trach or something yeah. else, you know, scary, or like, you know, but they honestly, they really do, um, they really, my experience is they really do a great job, and yeah. um and just that um, that little kick in their stuff that they have when they come back and they yeah. made friends and they had fun and it's so awesome. And for yeah. once, they're not thinking about what's wrong with them. They're thinking about having fun, yeah. you know, and um, so there's there's a lot of beauty in, in all of that. So uh, for sure. Well, thank you um, for, for sharing that. I think that, um, you know, we talk about transition a lot and, and transition after high school. And um, we're kind of of the mindset that, you know, we, we hope that kids are not coming out of high school, graduating from high school and then going home and mm -hmm. sitting at home and doing nothing. They do their video games or whatever in their four walls. And um, it's just it's pretty isolating. So it's not a matter of not being at home or living at home. It's just having some other activities, whatever it might be. It could be art therapy, music therapy, equine therapy, rec center. There's so many different things out there. And they don't have to be, uh, you know, really expensive. I mean, there are, are plenty of programs out there that are very expensive uh, or cost prohibitive, but there are a lot of programs out there that, um, that are not. And there are multiple camps. Um, so it might be too late for this summer. They're probably full and maybe not, but uh, there's multiple camps for loved ones with disabilities. So do definitely check them out. And uh, the most, most of the ones that we've seen our families uh, attend are in Texas. So they're, you're not a state away or anything like that. Okay. So for sure. So what we're going to kind of talk about now, we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk a little bit more about what a, you know, a special needs attorney does, what, you know, a special needs financial advisor does and kind of what the difference is. And I always say it kind of tongue in cheek, but uh, you're the paper and we're the money. Okay. <laughs> so the legal documents, you know, we're talking about trust and wills, healthcare power of attorney, power of attorney, guardianship, all of these things that um, in, in our community, we're rolling around those terms all the time. Um, but a lot of times people are calling our firm and saying, hey, I need guardianship, right? And that's definitely not what we do. But there's a lot of confusion in our community about the different roles and the hats that we wear. 
and, um, and, and kind of who does what. But in a nutshell, when you're planning for a loved one uh, with a disability, you need both. You need those legal documents in place um, and you need the, the, the money. You need the finances in place. And the truth is when it comes to planning for special needs, it's a big job financially because, you know, uh, we're going to spend 25 to 35 years in retirement. That's a long time. And many families need the money that they saved up over a 25 to 35 year career to fund their own retirement. So then, you know, so then what happens? So Christina, share with us a little bit about, you know, some of the legal advice and some of the activities that your firm does. Sure. Thank you, Allison. So we counsel clients on the appropriate type of legal instrument that they need or instruments, whether it's a will or a trust or both. Um, we also help them to interpret what the current law and policy is. Um, like your PowerPoint says, we do prepare try cases. Um, at least in Harris County, you have to be an attorney to bring a guardianship or probate um, case. You can't do it on your by yourself. Um, and there is one little detail I want everybody to know that in the state of Texas, you have to be an attorney in order to give Medicaid advice if you are charging a fee. So if you're, I mean, you can always explain Medicaid applica- uh, Medicaid programs, that's totally fine. Lots of professionals do that. But if you're actually representing um, an individual and you're charging a fee to do Medicaid planning, then you have to be an attorney. Um, and then we do, it's interesting, I get a lot of questions about, are you a lawyer, are you an esquire, are you an attorney? I think in some states those make a difference, but in the state of Texas we use those interchangeably. Um, I usually don't use the word esquire because I think that is so old fashioned and sounds funny. Like <laughs> I should have a big white wig or something like that and be at some sort of <laughs> legal proceeding in London. Um, but there are certain things that lawyers ha- are only able to do. And so that's why um, I like working with financial um, advisors like yourselves that don't try to dip in, in into the lawyer swimming pool and, and practice law without a license. And they call that the unauthorized practice of law. Um, now, the flip side of that coin is lawyers selling or providing financial advice. I never do that because I know just enough to be incredibly dangerous. So that's why I have people like you, Allison, to help me. Lawyers can sell or provide financial advice, but they have to do certain things for the client. They have to, number one, disclose that they are receiving some type of compensation. And number two, there's certain waivers that the client is supposed to sign. I believe in the kind of planning you do, which is I think you need the legal advice and then also the planning advice. And those really should be two separate individuals. Just pragmatically as a lawyer, I I don't have time to to keep up on everything that you do, Allison. You know, I've and I learn something new every day when I practice law. So there's no way I can also do all the financial and all the insurance updates and and policy changes. So I agree with you. I think you need both of us. (laughs) Well, and I just want to comment to um, Christina, we see week after week, week after week, we see documents um, created by A, all of you, the DIY, I'm going to download something off of the internet and create oh, my document. Yes, and, and, and I'm not like raining on anybody. I'm all about a DIY on something that I'm good at or, you know, whatever. Um, but when it comes to um, special needs, I, I strongly advise against DIY legal documents. And I also advise against Um, hiring an attorney that dabbles in special needs. Your situation is specialized. So just like I I use the analogy all the time of if you have a heart problem, you're not going to a podiatrist. You're not even going to go to the PCP. You're going to go see a specialist. And I liken the same thing when we have a loved one with a disability or special needs, just like David was talking about. There's so many moving parts with the waivers and Social Security and Medicaid and all of these other moving parts you want a professional that is truly nuanced um, in what you're dealing with. Because what I have seen on both sides 
um, on attorneys. And, and I use the example of um, the attorney next door or your brother that's a, a real estate attorney, those types of things that they can help you, but they're really not nuanced in that. And, and the thing is, you know, Christina, we know this from the UT Special Needs Planning Conference, the law changes. Things change from time to time. We typically recognize, you know, recommend that when it comes to the legal documents, um, you know, the trust and the legal documents as a whole, that it's probably wise to have them reviewed maybe every five years, mm -hmm. not to just do it and then sit on it for 15 or 20 years. Do you do you have a recommendation on that? I I probably do two years just because people move job to job so frequently and we want to make sure we get those beneficiary designations updated. And when you're looking at your documents, you also need to look where your beneficiary beneficiary docu beneficiary designations are as well. But I think two to five, I would say two years is is gold star. Five years is fine. And you know, on that beneficiary designation, that's something that we talk about all the time mm -hmm. um, as well. And there there is another um, misnomer out there in the community that when you have a will and you have everything set up, that everything is just set up. And true, the will is set up, but beneficiary designations follow the beneficiary mm -hmm. designation, not the will. So if you have life insurance, yes. um, you know, you know, beneficiaries on a 401k, 403b pension plan, we talked about the payable on death, um, the beneficiary designations do need to be changed to reflect your wishes or it's going to go however the beneficiary is mm -hmm. set up on, on that account. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, it gets put on the shelf. So if you're taking notes of like, you know, that I always, the little nuggets, the takeaway, check your beneficiaries, um, check your past employers, 403Bs, 401Ks, IRAs, brokerage accounts, life insurance contracts. Um, pension plans, because it, it does, um, we've actually even seen this in non-special needs cases where a person maybe had gotten divorced and they never changed the beneficiary and there's nothing that you can do. The person dies, it goes to the no, beneficiary. It's, I mean, I, want, yeah. I don't want to say nothing. You can hire yeah. an attorney, but it's an uphill battle yeah. is all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're exactly so, right. You're exactly right. For sure. And I was just going to say one more thing on the beneficiary designations. I think this is a spot where the attorney and the planner work together. So I create the paper, I create the vehicle, you do the funding, and then we work together to make sure those beneficiary designations are beautiful and perfect. So can I That's weigh exactly into, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that um, some of this also needs to be planned ahead of time because if there's a trust set up and in Mark's case he had uh, Medicaid benefits that were in, tied to his income, um, the, all of that could be planned ahead of time. It seems like Christina and Robert um, had very good insight into how to move money around and plan for that. And I think in Mark's case, um, had a little more planning been done up front, he might've been able to maintain his yeah. waiver program. Um, yeah. So yeah. there there are some implications on just assigning it to a person rather than like setting up a trust and stuff mm -hmm. like that. For sure. And, and we have, you know, and we've done this with Christina before, but like entire presentations on special needs trust, first party and third party trust. But if you're taking notes, um, the big thing that you don't want to do is name your, lo name your loved one directly as a beneficiary on anything that you have. And this is something else that we see the mistake every week. And this is a difference in a financial advisor versus someone that is nuanced and special needs. Because what a lot of people do is they name their spouse beneficiary primary beneficiary. And then as a contingent beneficiary, they say that's easy. We'll divide it equally amongst the children mm -hmm. and they name the kids outright. And mm -hmm. so to David's point there, when we name our loved one um, directly as a beneficiary, um, then it does uh, affect their eligibility for, for Medicaid and SSI. And there is a fix to it. So sometimes grandma and grandpa accidentally leave money to your special needs loved one or you, some, you, your special needs loved one inherits money that you didn't know was coming in their name. And at, Christina, tell us what the fix is, if that accidentally happens, and then tell us what needs to happen uh, on the front end to prevent the, 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 fire, the fire at the end. So there's a couple of different options. So let's say the scenario is kiddos on Medicaid, can't have more than $2,000 in their name just to set the, the, con, the context. Grandma dies, now grandma has left the child $50,000.
not a small amount of money, but not life changing, never going to have to worry about bills again money, but just enough money to be a big problem. So depending on the age of the adult child, we could maybe set up what we call a first party supplemental needs trust. Um, and depending on what family members are available, we may be able to create within the family. Um, we also have to look at if that individual is incapacitated or not. Um, I know I'm bringing up more problems than solutions, but the solution, just to clarify, is something that's called the first party supplemental needs trust. Um, you can also just spend the money on things that the person needs, like a pre need funeral contract, if there's like some type of therapy, maybe they um, have some type of vacation that they want to go on, and, it, and, and, it's, and it's what we would call a, a good fiduciary decision, they can do that. You can have a car, there's certain items that they can spend down on. So. Um, there's also the um, ABLE accounts, which you have a great presentation on. Um, and and um, Allison, you want to just give the folks watching just like a quick um, overview of the sure. ABLE. But, but the short answer is you can put money there and Medicaid and Social Security says it's okay, but Allison's going to give you a little detail now. The bottom line is, is it has to be a lower amount. So with the ABLE account, you can put $16,000 a year for 2022 and an additional 12880 if the individual with a disability is working. So in the example, in Christina's example of $50,000, it's too much money. We can't get $50,000 into the ABLE account. So, and so the bottom line is, from my perspective, is if your special needs loved one inherits money that's going to put them over the $2,000, my advice is to contact an attorney nuanced and special needs immediately to talk about your options um, and whether or not you need a first party special needs trust or not. So the first party special needs trust, basically you form it on the back end and they have costs, mm -hmm. you know, within the time that mm -hmm. it takes to, 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 to get that uh, set up. But the key thing is, is on that first party special needs trust, there's a Medicaid payback as yes. is the yeah. ABLE account, there's a Medicaid yeah. payback. So if they set it up properly on the front end with a third party special needs trust, there is no Medicaid payback. Is right. that correct? That is correct. That is correct. And that's where drafting is so important because I have seen a trust recently that was set up by mom and dad. Mom and dad gave money to this trust and never was received by the beneficiary, by their kiddo. And because they went to an attorney that pulled the form off the website, now that there is a payback to it. Yes, I was going to say, I've actually seen that recently, too, where there was a third party special needs trust because the attorney heard that mm -hmm. there has to be a Medicaid payback be. language yeah. in it. That's only true for the first party. So correct. now there's a Medicaid payback yeah. on the third party. So these are little, you know, little nuances that really, really matter at the end of the day. So, um, so for sure. Um, so, yeah, talk to us a, a little bit more about what your firm does and, um, and, and how you kind of pull these things together. So what we also do is we look at what Social Security benefits or Medicaid benefits that individual is on now. Um, like David has done uh, such a beautiful cleanup job for his family. Um, we work with families on the front end so that everybody knows what specific Medicaid program their, their loved one is on what specific um, social security program they're on, and we figure out what is that next step. So if SSI Medicaid is no longer providing all the services, then we talk about um, if you're on SSI Medicaid, you don't have to be on that to your interest list for star plus waiver. So, cause you can go ahead and bypass. We look at what is the next step if that person needs a higher level of care. And then we look at based on what money is available, what Medicaid benefits are going to be available, a sample budget through the stages. So let's say we've, we've got um, a case right now where the family's like, we never want to be on Medicaid ever, ever. Um, what kind of money do we need for that? And what's the budget for that? And then we look at, okay, if we do have to if we do need to have Medicaid, what would Medicaid pay for? And then what would the trust pay for? And then the longevity of that trust. So we look at Medicaid as a tool in the toolbox. You may need one tool right now during your part of your life. And then we look at the next step as well, figuring out what the different Medicaid programs would be. Also, we look at veterans benefits because there are benefits for um, uh, widows and people who served in the military. If I can have money coming in from the VA, 
that means maybe more money for that adult disabled child later on. So we also look at if the parents need long-term care and they are not eligible for long-term care insurance, how can we use the Medicaid system to help the parents so that we have that bucket of money, um, a bigger bucket of money going to the adult child. So we look at the family like a table because we have one bucket of money, we have one table, that bucket of money has to support the whole table. What can we do that's private pay and Medicaid so that we have, we have a smooth transition planning. But I wanna give David a lot of gold stars for his cleanup work. He is an A plus student, A plus plus student. Um, and you know, if your current job doesn't ever work out, I think the special needs community would welcome you with open arms because boy, you, you know how to clean up it. You, you clean it up really nicely. So well done. Well, thank sure. you for saying that, Christine. I'll, I'll stick to engineering. <laughs> um, one of the things, and as Christina said, we don't really give Medicaid advice. In fact, there's like over 100, what is 107? Are we up to 107 100, Medicaid uh, programs? 100, 109 is my last count. Yes. 100, 109 Medicaid programs in the state of Texas. So if you ever wonder why you call Health and Human Services and they seem confused on their programs, that's probably why. <laughs> um, but what we do on the Social Security side of the house, we're nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, and we actually have a specialized software that plugs in all of the parents' information and the loved one with the disabilities information, and it, sp it spits out dollars and cents how to maximize the benefits, whether it's, it's SSI, um, whether it's RSDI under a parent's record, they called it uh, DAC, Disabled Adult Child, for 40 years, and they've since changed the name to Childhood Disability Benefits. Now, now that we finally figured it all out as DAC, now it's being referred to as Childhood Disability Benefits. But this software is specifically geared towards families who have a loved one with a disability to maximize those benefits that is that your loved one will be covered under a parent's record. So in David's situation, Mark is getting um, RSDI basically under the parent's record. So that means that the parents were, well, they're deceased now, but if they're already retired or already drawing Social Security disability, then because um, Mark's disability started prior to age 22, then he's eligible to be covered under a parent's record. So we work closely um, with the law firms to, to give those money the, those money calculations, the dollar, dollars and cents, because as I mentioned, the Social Security Administration, if you call them up and tell them you want to turn on benefits, they're going to say, OK, they don't it, they're not going to say, well, maybe you should wait because this, this, this and this or you could get this much more money over the long term or things like that. But this software gives you kind of a, I would call it a decision center um, for you to kind of look at what are our options? How do we maximize this and what makes the most sense for our family uh, financially? Um, so when it comes to a special needs uh, advisor, what do we do? Um, so we're going to provide that financial advice. Um, it could be fee-based or commission-based. Um, a lot of families come to us and they say, um, we want to plan for our loved one. Um, you know, he or she's going to have care needs for the rest of their life, not just ours. But financially, we don't even know how much we need to plan for this. Um, so we're able, able to calculate future care cost estimates. And I like to call them small, medium, and large. So we have some people that want, you know, show us what it's going to cost for full residential care. Some people want to have, um, like we talked about, like maybe living at home and having other outside, maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a transition program or other outside activities that they're participating in. Some are group homes. So, and some are a transition. So we might start off small and graduate to, to a higher level of care as the caregiver's um, caregiving ability diminishes as they get older and maybe aren't as well as themselves. So we're able to calculate all of that. But we're also able to do over, overarching you know, financial plans of how does the future care cost estimates come in to the overall financial plan? Because remember, we got to retire 25 to 35 years of retirement. And as parents, we're the funder of all of this, right? So we want to make sure that we um, have money in the right buckets, and we want to make sure that things are properly funded. So what if you don't have millions of dollars to fund a trust? Um, a lot of people don't, and that's okay. But a lot of times, um, the way people are funding uh, the future care of their loved one is for is with a, maybe a life insurance policy that uh, upon your death funds 
the special needs trust. So you're going to be using your retirement assets while you're alive. If there's anything left, it'll go to the special needs trust or any other children that you may uh, have. And then the other part of the care could be funded from from a life insurance policy that is properly set up as the special needs trust as the beneficiary. So um, so we t- kind of talked about the um, money in the right bu- buckets, but we're also able to um, you know, assess current assets and forecast the ability to retire and pay for the future care. And, um, and we're going to be able to provide the advice of which financial vehicles are going to help you reach the goals well within um, your ability to handle risk and kind of how you feel about risk in the overall market. I know uh, in general, a lot of people are pretty nervous about the market. It's been pretty volatile for the last few months. So I know um, people don't feel overly excited about that. Um, We're going to do a needs analysis for protection because a lot of times families come to us and they'll say, I don't know how much life insurance we need. I know we need it, but I don't know how much we need. And so um, an advisor, Nuance and Special Needs, they're going to talk to you about what's important to you. Sometimes it's income replacement, and that's a big one. We've got, um, you know, a a family member that has a, a high level of income if something happens to them prematurely during their working years, their income dies with them. So if your overall, you know, family, um, you know, is, is running off of that income coming in, there needs to be some income replacement. Uh, we manage assets and um, we talk about transition planning, um, both special needs and life. We're able to help set up ABLE accounts. And um, we do a lot of advocacy, which if you've joined our webinars and bef- uh, before, a lot of our advocacy comes through uh, the webinars and partnering with other organizations and getting messages out. Um, it is, um, we love providing information and getting information out there to, um, to share with you as a parent myself. I felt it was challenging and I know this. I eat, sleep and breathe it, Christina, Rob. You guys have a family member, you know this, you eat, sleep, and breathe it, but it still doesn't make it um, a a lot easier. So we really like to share a lot of the things that we've come across along the way to help you feel like, if nothing else, that you feel like, hey, I can do this. It is not completely overwhelming. I know where to get some resources and get some help. So I think that that is part of it. And of course, um, we're going to, you know, discuss and strategize on SSI and Medicaid and when it comes to Medicaid, we're really talking about how to not lose it. So we're not getting into the details of 109 programs or anything like that. We're talking about money in the right buckets and how to not accidentally lose your Medicaid status. All of the waivers, all of the Medicaid waivers in the state of um, Texas, all the all of the waivers in the state of Texas are Medicaid waivers. So you got to maintain that Medicaid eligibility, um, so that way you don't accidentally either lose SSI or accidentally lose one of those waivers that you've um, waited for for so long. And of course, we've got the Social Security maximization analysis that we talked about um, a, a moment ago. And then, really, we we come together. So you know, when we talk about the paper and the money. Um, you know, you know, a, a law firm, they're going to get those documents together, and that's going to give us the proper wording that we need uh, to be able to change the beneficiaries on any accounts that are that are set up. And, and generally for us, even if it's not a plan that we have implemented or we have done, um, we'll provide guidance and let, get those forms, you know, get those forms over to us. We'll help you fill them out and then just send them over to you for signatures and for you to, uh, to submit. But we, we like, you know, working together and partnering together because it is kind of two, two ways that you come to the table uh, when it comes to planning for sure. So I, um, I would just, you know, like to say thank you for, um, for everybody that has attended today. We certainly are open uh, to any questions uh, that you guys have. And, and Christina and Rob, Dave, um, please chime in if there's any other um, things that you'd like to mention that you know, we kind of scratched the surface on a few things. So tell, you know, t- talk to us about that. Yeah, jump in real quick. I, I think if I have any parting words, um, having gone through this with my dad and trying to do all this after the fact, it would have been so nice to be able to talk to Karen about this and figure out what was going on ahead of time. Um, but obviously that didn't happen. So if, if any of you have transition plans outlined in your head, please take the time to write it down and talk to somebody. Um, really think that would make 
things uh, things easier for our loved ones um, if something bad were to happen. I call it intentional conversations, and these intentional conversations are tough, right? Because nobody wants to talk about dying or when you're not here anymore or, or kind of the, the, the morbid conversation, but having these intentional conversations now, and it's not just with our, you know, you know, regarding our special needs loved ones, it's, you know, your aging parents. Do your aging parents have a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney? Do they, you know, do they have that medical directive um, don't wait until the crisis happens, till somebody's had a stroke and they're incapacitated, you know, because things that the, the truth is, is life is busy. Life is busy and things get put on the shelf. We do things and then we don't look at them for many, many years because we've kind of checked the box of it's done. And, um, and then, then we find out it's not done or it's lost or things like that. So just, just, you know, it, having those intentional conversations. And I would also say, Christina, and you can, you know, tell us your thoughts on that. I'm a huge fan of our neurotypical kids that are turning 18 and they're going off to college. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the healthcare power of attorney and power of attorney. We've, we've had some real issues with clients um, where like one was a, a fire at the apartment complex at Texas state. Yeah. That was one example yeah. and kids were carried off in ambulances. And another one, um, where we've seen over the last two years repeating itself is mental health crisis in our neurotypical kids um, where they're hauled off to a mental health facility. And without the proper documentation in place, you're going to be hard pressed for them to even tell you where they took your kids. Yeah. So um, it's a I, no, tough I, about I that, Christina. I, I think any, any, I mean, this is a hard thing about being a parent is that you realize when your kiddo turns 18, they may be on your payroll, but you have no authority over them anymore. So even if it, any child, it, when they turn 18, they need a financial, medical, HIPAA release. If there's mental health issues, you can appoint uh, someone on the HIPAA release to communicate with the medical health professionals. So yes, yes. And we've had lots of grumpy 18 year olds in our office, bleary eyed going, why am I here over Thanksgiving break signing this PLA? <laughs> It's, I, I just I, I just can't stress it enough. I think it's really, really important. Yeah. Um, Christina and Rob, thank you for um, taking the, the time to, to, to you know be here with us today and kind of share your insight. I know that you're here in the greater Houston area um, and we've got your contact information um, up and just tell us if I already have documents in place, can you review my existing yeah, documents? You mentioned course, two years. What, tell, us, tell us how we engage with you. Yeah. So you call our office, you book an appointment. Uh, it's usually about an hour, two hours. We charge uh, $4.95 for two hour review. We'll review the documents, whatever you send to me before, uh, we'll review it. Um, I love PowerPoint like Allison. <laughs> so I will have a PowerPoint presentation ready for you. Um, the more information you give me, the better that PowerPoint presentation is going to be. And then depending on the work that needs to be done, we always bill flat fee. So that means I don't bill hourly. So you'll always know exactly how much you're going to charge. So that's how you engage with us. Um, you can also take a look at us um, on our website that you have listed there. We're also on Facebook. If you want to see Rob and I, our, our, our witty banter between each other, you can just hop on Facebook and just um, enter in a search engine law office of Christina Lesher. We've got a lot of free videos there and we do all kinds of things. I like love them. I, lo I love your bantering. <laughs> we are pretty funny. I think I'm, I think I'm funnier than Rob thinks I am. <laughs> but no comment. That, well, that happens in family. So that, that, that is for sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. We have our, um, I'm going to speed through here and you guys are going to get this. We do have our YouTube channel. All of our past webinars live on our YouTube channel and that is, you can subscribe to that for free and kind of peruse the topics and see if there's anything that's relative to the stuff that you're on uh, in your journey. If you need uh, to kind of talk from a financial perspective on the special needs side, um, we do offer a free personalized consultation to kind of learn a little bit more about the planning that you've done what's important to you and, um, you know, how we might be able to help you going forward. All of our plans are customized to the families that we're, um, to, that we're working with. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. And um, I appreciate David. David, you get the biggest, I give you an A plus too. And I would just like to say thank you, David, for submitting yourself to us. 
um, yeah. and recommending this webinar. We've never done a webinar uh, exactly like this. And I think a lot of families, you know, this is something families worry about. They think about, they attend these webinars because it's on their radar and they want to know how it all works and they want to make sure that, you know, that the bumps in the road aren't there uh, for their loved ones. So you are, um, you're a rock star. So, Thanks. and, and doing this from, from another state, it has extra points for that. But thank you. Thank you so much for your, your willingness to share your family's story and kind of where you were and where you've been and how you have, um, how, how you fixed it. So thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate I have, all the help. And, Absolutely. And everyone, um, I'd just like to thank you for uh, attending today. And again, you guys will get an email later today with the slides and the recording. It's certainly been our pleasure and we look forward to uh, meeting with you again soon. Take care. Everybody take care. Thank you. Thank you.